For two years, eh, for, for seven years, okay, sorry, for a lifetime, Cody Rhodes has been telling a story that has defined him as a performer. Growing up as the son of Dusty Rhodes, Cody has had some pretty big shoes to fill, as well as an entire life of preparation and looking to fill them. And at WrestleMania 40, he finally did it. Finally, after watching his father get screwed out of the richest prize in professional wrestling, and after seeing his family portrayed as a joke, for decades in WWE, he has avenged those lessons by dethroning one of the most dominant champions of all time, Roman Reigns. So, my name is Grease from Wrestleology, and today, let us take a look at Cody Rhodes. How did one man go on to have not only a generation-defying moment at WrestleMania, but also redefine that very same generation that he now leads as the flag bearer for success? Today is how Cody, along with much of the Rhodes legacy, went from undesirable to to undeniable, to now simply undisputed. Beginning with that Rhodes family, Cody comes from a long line of professional wrestling legends. His father, Dusty Rhodes, was one of the greatest wrestling minds of his time. Not only did he take part in some of the most legendary wrestling moments in history, but he was also a massively influential man backstage, helping to run the shows while creating a legacy as a booker. He even went on to create the War Games match, which I think we can all agree is a brilliant inclusion to the world of wrestling. Cody's older brother, Dustin Rhodes, has his own successful run in wrestling, becoming the legendary Goldust character. However, while the Rhodes family has had much success, Cody has watched WWE humiliate his family. While Dusty was a legend in WCW and the NWA, WWE had him dress in polka dots, dancing around as comedy fodder. The Goldust character has had some rather uncomfortable moments in his time as well, with these things sticking with Cody as he grew up. But nonetheless, these things didn't stop him from pursuing suing WWE, looking to follow in his father's footsteps as one of the most influential wrestlers of all time. After Dusty used his connections to put Cody through OVW, WWE's developmental system at the time, the call from the main roster came, and in 2007, a young, fresh-faced Cody Rhodes made his debut as part of Dusty's own feud with the legend killer, Randy Orton. Ironic, given how connected Cody would be to Randy in the years to follow, but after interrupting a backstage segment between Orton and Dusty, Cody Cody got his hands on Orton on Raw. On July 16th, 2007, Cody looked to stand up to Orton on behalf of his dad, but he would lose two weeks in a row to the Viper. And following this, Cody would sit around in the mid-card, beginning a feud with Hardcore Holly before earning the veterans' respect. The two would form a tag team, winning the tag titles from Lance Cade and Trevor Murdoch during Raw's 15th anniversary show. But after winning the gold, Cody would quickly make a major change for his career. The champions began feuding with another fellow newcomer, Ted DiBiase Jr., who challenged them to a match at Night of Champions. Ted Jr. and a mystery partner were challenging for the belts, but but things took an unexpected turn before the match could get going. Yes, Cody attacked Holly, allowing Ted to pick up the win and announcing that his mystery partner was, in fact, one of his opponents in Cody Rhodes. And from there, the two went along as a tag team before eventually crossing paths with Randy Orton. And Orton, DiBiase, and Cody created a faction to dominate over WWE as a trio of superstars that came from a wrestling lineage. Legacy, as they would be called, ran Raw for over a year, with Orton typically holding the WWE Championship as Rhodes and DiBiase fought alongside him against the biggest stars at the time. Cody and DiBiase even headlined Hell in a Cell against Shawn Michaels and Triple H. This faction really elevated Cody as well. However, by the time WrestleMania 26 came around, the entire group would collapse in on itself. And after Randy defeated his two former allies in a triple threat match at WrestleMania, Cody was drafted over to SmackDown, and there, he would finally have to stand on his own, looking to lurk through the dangerous waters of WWE by himself for the first time, pretty much. But after a few losses on the brand, including a loss in the 2010 SmackDown Money in the Bank ladder match, Cody would introduce a new gimmick. Being a total narcissist, valuing his good looks, Cody would become extremely protective of his face during matches, now going by dashing Cody Rhodes. And he finally had a gimmick to bite his teeth into with his vignettes about male grooming being a fun little bit on the show. 
And while this was an enjoyable enough character for the young superstar, this gimmick would evolve into something rather interesting. After winning and then losing the tag titles alongside Drew McIntyre in a blink and you'll miss them tag team, Cody would begin feuding with Rey Mysterio. During a match with Mysterio, Cody legitimately broke his nose and was forced to wear a protective mask as it healed. This accident, however, was a blessing in disguise as Cody declared that he was now undashing. Coming down to the ring in the mask, he would target Rey and began his journey towards him in his first singles match against him at WrestleMania 27. The character work, as he had this new deranged edge to his character, was some of Cody's best work as a performer in my opinion, and he was even able to beat Rey at WrestleMania, defeating the legendary Luchador. Cody's work just seemed to be getting better and better, with him constantly adding little wrinkles to the gimmick, such as when he began putting paper bags over people's heads to hide their faces in the crowd. And with his popularity continuing to build, Cody soon captured the Intercontinental Championship from Ezekiel Jackson on the August 12, 2011 edition of SmackDown. And to cement his reign as even more historic, Cody brought back the much beloved classic design of the belt with a white strap. Bringing back one of the most beloved championship designs is going to really bolster your popularity, all right, and this boost allowed him to push higher up the card. So he reignited his feud with the main event star, Randy Orton, around this time. Sprung from Cody feeling mistreated from his time in Legacy, Cody targeted Orton until Randy put the ultimate exclamation mark on the feud, breaking his mask during a street fight. And from there, Cody would make his title reign even more intriguing by feuding with the commentator and legend, Booker T. This was before all of his weird podcast takes, though, so seeing Booker wrestle in the ring for the gold was exciting at the time, with Rhodes retaining the belt. However, Cody's reign soon came to an end at WrestleMania 27, which, fun fact, I was actually in attendance for when I was like 11 years old. But after weeks of mocking the Big Show's lack of WrestleMania showcases, Show challenged Rhodes to a match. There, he ended the reign at 233 days, soon dropping it back to Cody at Extreme Rules only a few weeks later. This run, however, wasn't nearly as memorable with him losing the gold to Christian at Over the Limit. But after cementing his name as one of the great intercontinental champions of his generations, Cody would hang around the midcard for a little while. Eventually, though, he began teaming with Damian Sandow, targeting Team Hell No and their tag team championships. With the duo now going by the Rhodes Scholars, they would become an interesting tag team in their own right, despite having an unimpressive run in the ring. After all, both Cody and Sandow are pretty good on the mic, so they immediately added another level to the tag division with their promos. But after Sandow betrayed Cody during the 2013 Money in the Bank ladder match to win the briefcase, Cody would put an end to their friendship by defeating him at SummerSlam. Also a little bit off topic, but comment down below if you would like to see a video on Damian Sandow. I feel like he was always one of the most underrated people on the roster. But following this entertaining tag team situation, Cody would soon find himself forced into another team for a battle over his own career this time. In 2013, Triple H would form The Authority alongside his wife, Stephanie, Randy Orton, and The Shield. As the evil authority figures of WWE, many superstars would look to stand up to them, including Cody. And this, angering the boss, pushed Triple H into firing Cody. In reality, this was used as a way to write off Rhodes in order to marry his wife and mother of their daughter, Brandy. But on screen, however, his brother and father would stand up to the authority, and Goldust even began fighting on behalf of his brother, trying to get him reinstated. When that failed, Dusty pleaded as well, only to get knocked out by the Big Show by the orders of the authority. However, the brothers soon returned to Raw, fighting to get their jobs back, and at Battleground 2013, Goldust and Cody battled against Roman and Seth in one of the best matches in the Shield's history, in my opinion. Now reinstated after picking up the victory, the brothers would also pick up the tag team titles from the Shield a week later on Raw, and Cody and the rest of the Rhodes family were a pretty integral part of Raw around this time, having Cody once again succeeding on a higher place in the card. From there, however, Cody's time in WWE would start to decline. After losing to the New Age Outlaws at Royal Rumble in 2014, yes, the New Age Outlaws were actually champions in WWE in a 
2014. You heard me correctly. Anyway, WWE Creative made a decision that would, in some ways, be the very first seed towards wrestling's biggest revolution in decades. In an attempt to freshen up Cody Rhodes with a gimmick as crazy as his brother's, they invented the Stardust character, a goofy, manacle, almost comic book-like villain of the roster. Taking heavy inspiration from Jim Carrey and Batman Forever, he would act outlandish in his promos about space dust and redstone or whatever the hell his ramblings were about. Suffice to say, the character didn't fit Cody, and after breaking away from his brother to turn heel, blowing off their brother versus brother storyline a few weeks before WrestleMania, Cody was left adrift. Soon after this big change, another big change would occur in Cody's life, because on June 11th, 2015, Dusty Rhodes passed away due to kidney failure at only 69 years old, and this heartbreak took Cody away from TV, grieving the loss. Cody, while processing the passing, saw this pain as an opportunity for WWE to change his character. Hoping to rip away from the Stardust gimmick, Cody would unfortunately return to work to drown us some more in the cosmos. And while Cody is dealing with his heartbreak, he returned to work still feeling underutilized and creatively frustrated. I mean, sure, he had a high profile match soon after at SummerSlam 2015, facing off against Arrow star Stephen Amell in a tag team match, but Cody still hated running around as this wacky comedy-like gimmick. And with even the Intercontinental Championship looking like an impossible goal to achieve, losing in actually a rather fun WrestleMania 32 ladder match for the belt, Cody had pretty much had enough at this point. After being ignored for months by WWE Creative, who he was continuously pitching ideas to for his character, and after seeing indie guys like the Young Bucks, Adam Cole, Kenny Omega, and more excelling outside of WWE, Rhodes asked for his release. On May 22nd, 2016, WWE finally let Cody go from his contract, and with that release, Cody immediately knew what to do now that he was away from WWE, especially as he was entering an incredibly healthy independent scene at the time. On Twitter, now X, Cody posted a list of people he wanted to face on the indies, with a long-term plan to prove that he was WWE's biggest loss. Adam Cole, Kurt Angle, and more were on his list, with a few of those names becoming crucial in Cody's path towards success. Soon, he joined the Bullet Club alongside the likes of Kenny Omega, the Young Bucks, and Hangman Adam Page. Bullet Club, perhaps the most beloved faction in wrestling at the time, helped to elevate the independent scene and popularity of companies like New Japan and Ring of Honor. And with Cody seeing his efforts rewarded as a part of Bullet Club, a simple exchange online with Dave Meltzer would change the wrestling world forever. During a Q&A, a fan asked Meltzer about the possibility of Ring of Honor's selling out a venue with 10,000 fans. When Meltzer replied stating that they couldn't pull it off, Cody took it as a personal challenge. A few months later, a special super indie show took place called All In. Ring of Honor, New Japan Pro Wrestling, CMLL, NWA, and more all pitched in to help make the show the biggest indie wrestling event of all time. And with a stacked card featuring the likes of Omega vs. Penta, Hangman vs. Janela in a street fight, and Steve even Amell versus Christopher Daniels, it was perhaps Cody who stole the show in terms of emotion. You see, while Dusty failed to capture the WWE Championship in his day, he would still become a main event champion in another top promotion, NWA. So Cody saw the NWA World's Championship as a goal as well, looking to replicate the success of his father by holding the very same title that he held. And after a little over 20 minutes, Cody was finally able to counter Nick Aldis, rolling him up to win the gold. And with another thing checked off his list, and after all the success of All In, a new path for Cody would soon be revealed. On January 1st, 2019, a world-shaking announcement would take place with the reveal that All Elite Wrestling was coming soon to our screens. Yes, with All In showcasing the true buzz of independent wrestling, as well as the star power of guys like Omega, The Box, and Cody, billionaire and lifelong fan of wrestling Tony Khan saw a major opportunity. With wrestling monopolized by WWE, there was room there for a new competitor to rival the company. So creating AEW, Tony Khan threw everything into this new business to try and become the best promotion in the world. And with guys like Chris Jericho shockingly joining the promotion, fans were buzzing to watch their first ever event, Double or Nothing. There, Cody would finish another chapter in the Rhodes family, facing off against brother 
featured Dustin Rhodes in one of the most emotional matches in wrestling history. This would soon become Pro Wrestling Illustrated's match of the year, with Cody showcasing this blend in wrestling styles that was pretty unique to him, combining the emotion of old school wrestling with a high octane athleticism of the indies. From there, Cody would lead AEW as he continuously looked to help elevate anyone in the company. Sean Spears, Darby Allin, and MJF would all become linked to Cody in the build up towards the first episode of AEW Dynamite, with Cody soon becoming number one contender to Chris Jericho's AEW Championship. After taking part in Dynamite's first ever match, rolling up Sammy Guevara to pick up the victory, Cody's feud with Jericho would intensify as Jericho formed the inner circle to rival the elite of Cody, Omega, Hangman, and the Bucks. However, as a part of this feud, Cody would add a shocking stipulation. As a figure of upper management, he didn't want fans to question his motives and whether or not he would selfishly target the world championship, so at full gear, if Cody didn't win the AEW championship from Chris Jericho, he would never be allowed to challenge for the gold again. But while he put on an excellent fight against the champion, Cody's world title aspirations would get ripped away from him. MJF, then a friend of Cody's, threw in the towel to turn on Cody and allow Jericho to walk out with the belt. But Cody would remain as a main fixture of AEW programming. After losing to MJF at Revolution to conclude their intense and excellent rivalry, Cody would cement his status as one of AEW's most beloved names. As the world was shutting down for the pandemic, it was Cody who opened up the first episode of Dynamite with no fans. After that heartfelt speech by Cody and the rest of the elite, Cody would look to continue to elevate the mid-card scene by becoming the inaugural TNT champion. And since he couldn't compete for the world title, Cody made sure to do everything he could to make his run exciting, with his name still linked to the belt as one of its greatest champions. And when he lost the title to the late Brody Lee, rest in peace, Cody's popularity was elevated as champion. But once he left the TNT title scene, it was clear that Cody's placement in AEW was a bit awkward. He was arguably the company's most popular good guy, but he could never challenge for the world title. So one of the biggest main event stars in the company had to work away from the world championship, which kind of felt off at the time. This led fans to create what they called the Cody Vortex, a concept describing how people who Cody feuded with always felt disconnected from the main event scene despite them taking on this major name. Fans slowly turned on Cody despite Cody's positioning as a top babyface, and with Cody refusing to turn heel, fans became louder and louder in their distaste for Cody. This clearly angered Rhodes, who, in the build-up to his ladder match against Sammy Guevara for the TNT Championship at Beach Break 2022, Cody described his frustrations while reminding fans just how important a figure he's been in AEW. And while this could have very easily turned him into a heel, Cody's delivery during the promo made many fall back in love with him, and after putting on an exciting match against Guevara, providing AEW fans with a jaw drop flying cutter off the top, some people started coming back around to Cody, and with Cody putting on this excellent match, it would turn out to be Cody's swan song from All Elite Wrestling. Yeah, despite him helping create the promotion, Cody felt it was time to move on. While he's never said publicly exactly why he left, many fans have theorized that it was a combination of the fans growing distant from Cody and Cody's views of pro wrestling growing distant from the elite, as Cody would evolve to wrestle rather differently from the rest of the elite. Whatever the case may be, Cody decided to leave AEW and was once again a major free agent. But with WrestleMania 38 right around the corner at that time, and with the American Nightmare now looking forward to a future outside of AEW, Cody would be revealed as a shocking surprise opponent for Seth Rollins. And with Cody building up his name so much outside of WWE, the company had no choice but to acknowledge all of the growth that he's had. Coming out looking almost identical to who he was in AEW, down to the American Nightmare nickname, Cody would defeat Rollins in his return match. The following night, Cody made his intentions clear, talking about his father and the dream he never got to accomplish winning the WWE Championship. And now that Cody had returned as a white hot good guy on Raw, his goal was to live out the dream of the American dream. However, while targeting the WWE Championship, Seth would continue being a thorn in Cody's side, leading into a now iconic Hell in a Cell match. After tearing his pectoral muscle, Cody walked into Hell in a Cell hurt and injured. And when fans saw just how bruised and damaged his muscle was, Cody became even more beloved, launching 
him even higher up the card. After defeating Seth, Cody would take some time away to heal his injuries, but months after this incredible performance, Rhodes returned to enter the Royal Rumble match at number 30, winning the whole thing by last eliminating Gunther to claim his ticket towards the WrestleMania 39 main event. And after teasing this match for almost a year earlier upon his return, Cody was finally going to get his hands on the tribal chief, Roman Reigns. And with Reigns now put in the most vulnerable position, with many of the roster targeting Roman after years of tyranny over WWE, it looked like Cody would finally get to win the WWE Championship. Sadly though, life isn't always so simple. Despite him being ejected from ringside earlier in the match, Solo Sokoa would attack Cody during the match, helping Roman retain his championship. Crushed and heartbroken, Cody sat in the middle of the ring with the bloodline continuing their rule over WWE. From there, Cody would begin a feud with the recently returned Brock Lesnar after Lesnar turned heel on Cody the night after WrestleMania. And Cody would spend the next few months facing off against Lesnar while also dealing with the Judgment Day on Raw. But at SummerSlam, Cody finally beat Brock to put an end to their feud. But it was clear that Cody still had Roman in the back of his mind throughout the year. He knew that he was screwed out of the title and he knew if given another chance and possibly with some help, he could maybe pull it off. He personally invited Jey Uso to Raw after Uso turned on the bloodline and quit SmackDown, soon winning the tag team titles with him. He also fought alongside Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens, men that have had their own hatred against the Tribal Chief in war games, and after winning the 2024 Royal Rumble match, last eliminating CM Punk, Cody's year-long recruitment plan looked to have finally be paying off. And then everything changed. After a year of Roman's title reign failing to live up to expectations, Cody's rivalry with the Bloodline would heat up exponentially once The Rock joined into the conversation. Announcing at the WrestleMania kickoff press conference that he would target Roman's undisputed universal title, The Rock would shockingly turn heel to stand alongside Roman in the build-up to WrestleMania. Cody hadn't calculated this before, so he asked for one more man to help him take down the tribal chief, Seth Rollins, the same man who he beat upon his return to WWE, the same man who destroyed the shield, was now standing alongside Cody in this war against the bloodline. And by the time WrestleMania 40 came around, both nights would feature Cody in the main event. On the first night, Cody and Seth lost to Roman and Rock in an insane tag team match with Cody actually getting pinned by The Rock. But on the following night, during Cody's match against Roman for the title in a Bloodline Rules match, Cody's plan would finally pay off. Enemies of the Bloodline like Jey Uso, Seth Rollins, John Cena, and even The Undertaker all came down to help Cody ward off the bloodline. In one of the craziest WrestleMania main events of all time, Cody would catch Roman hitting three consecutive crossroads on the Tribal Chief, and finally, the story that had begun decades prior was complete. Finally, the dream of Dusty was accomplished, and with Cody posing alongside his mother with the title, Cody finished WrestleMania 40 as WWE's biggest superstar. Where his run takes him, I'm not too sure. Sure, he just recently beat AJ Styles at Backlash, but there are so many ways Cody's run can go. We still have Roman and The Rock looming in the background as well, watching WWE from the shadows, waiting to finally strike the American Nightmare. However, many men have tried and many men have failed. Hell, even an entire company tried to take down Cody, but he still persevered. He helped build a revolution in pro wrestling, literally helping create WWE's biggest rival promotion today in AEW. And on top of that, he did so while honoring himself and his family as a class act. When WWE pushed him down, he stood back and proved to them just why Cody is a generation-defying talent. He changed an entire industry, building up everyone he could in the process, and helped lead us into the the wrestling boom that we see today and with Cody now the most popular babyface in WWE I'm excited to see what story he'll write as our undisputed WWE champion thank you so much for watching and subscribe if you enjoyed